Hello and welcome to Access Chat. Today I'm delighted to welcome Aya Jibril, who is an inclusive design and accessibility consultant with Alkamam Consultants in Saudi Arabia. Uh, it's great to have you with us. We first met in Geneva at the ILO a couple of years back. Um, really keen to hear about what you're doing, how you got into the field, and then talk a bit more about uh, the work that's going on on accessibility in KSA, because I know there's a lot going on and a lot of people don't hear about it. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much, Neil and Antonio, for hosting me today at X Chat. I, I'm a really big fan of what you guys are doing here. It's amazing how the discussion about accessibility is accelerating. And um, I love being part of this. Well, actually, I, um, I graduated from a design school and uh, I have a background in general in art direction and creative direction. And uh, from there, I started to learn more about the inclusive design world and how us designers and creators can um, expand the influence and benefit of what they are creating, whether it's buildings or spaces or, you know, any visual arts or systems. At the end of the day, it's reachable for all of us. And such a mission and a vision in anyone's life would definitely enrich their experiences. And I was really passionate about that. And from there, I started to more um, work closely about inclusive design. I've joined the company Qadrun uh, 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 Business Disability Network, where they've been working closely about inclusion of people with disabilities in the workforce. And from there, I started to specialize more in the digital inclusion and uh, built environment inclu inclusion. And um, since um, around 2013, I started to get uh, more certifications about that. I have a certification in disability management and also as uh, a CPAC, which is a certified professional in accessibility from IWP. And um, also I'm uh, uh, part of representing a G3 ICT entity uh, for uh, as a representative uh, for Saudi Arabia. And I think um, being involved in such uh, global platforms is, is really benefiting the um, Saudi Arabia itself and the national transformation initiatives and programs that's been taking place lately around um, digitalizing government and non-government services for all the people in Saudi Arabia and also the uh, uh, passion about including people with disabilities has risen and uh, um, and we believe that we have now real steps and real um, support uh, to uh, include people with disabilities, as bo both as employees and as customers. And business in general in Saudi Arabia started to also tune in to that mindset uh, and believe in the business case of people with disabilities, although that are still are many uh, barriers and challenges, let's say, to for us as you know experts in this field, trying to make this change hand in hand with you know people committed from different entities, and at the same time, um, the work has been taking part, whether it's in the educational sector or you know um, uh, healthcare and also you know um, other sectors in the economy in general. Uh, so. Um, yeah. So that's basically what takes me here. Now I've yeah. been working in Al-Qimam Consultancy Office. So I've been working closely uh, with uh, one of the leaders in this industry in Saudi Arabia, Dr. Mirba Tashkandi. She's been working for more than 20 years about the, the field of inclusion. And me and her, we believe that there are really uh, a big opportunity for us to start tapping on the different sectors, sectors I mentioned and trying, you know, join the transformation. Uh, that's good for the people in general here. So, yeah, that's... That's fantastic. And I, I, I know from when I visited KSA a, a couple of years ago that there's a great opportunity to build a, an inclusive society because to a large extent you've, you've got rapid growth and, and you're building all of this infrastructure now. So, so it, it's, it's now or never to a certain yeah. extent with, with, with some of the infrastructure, you know, and we, we, we'll 
definitely want to come and talk about you know some of the big infrastructure projects you've got underway like neon maybe a little later but i also saw the you know the airports were accessible there were signs talking about uh, accessibility throughout throughout buildings and the public spaces so there is definitely you know uh, a broad general awareness and, uh, and willingness and and yet it's not something that we perceive out of our own little sort of northern european bubble as happening um so at the same time because you're not part of the northern european bubble there are differences between what's required uh yes. for northern european societies and and certainly the anglosphere and um the arab speaking world so so what have been some of the challenges that that you faced and that um accessibility in in saudi has faced um adapting some of the policies and tools that have been established in other parts of the world to really be fit for purpose for the arabic speaking world okay great great question you know there, there is um you know um let's say unique challenges that we're facing and we let me start with me into Saudi Arabia. So basically, um, I think one of the main major, you know, barriers that we're having here is the lack of codes, unified codes and unified standards that's helping, you know, um, organizations, you know, have a clear path on what needed to be as an infrastructure to build, to build a smart city or, you know, an inclusive service or an accessibility in general, both physical or digital. So lack of such unified codes and reinforcing them, activating them, you know, um, holding people or companies or entities accountable for it. And that's where we are looking more towards having more, you know, regulations, uh, you know, uh, where governments enforce entities in a way or another to, you know, uh, be compliant. So such um, such infrastructure, which is really imperative and important for the inclusion of people with disabilities uh, is really missing MENA version, you know? And still a lot of countries in, 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 in MENA are, you know, racing towards having, you know, uh, more and more regulations on the way and enforcements and also also changing the mindset where you know other countries still did not start the race or there is a huge lack of you know awareness about the inclusion of people with disabilities as part of the human rights so you know there is a lot of variables and the work is more this way and you need you know to connect more the countries where they need to share best practices, where they need to be supporting each other in such direction. And um, I think that's what makes us different from, uh, you know, around the world. But at the same time, I think it's an opportunity for, you know, um, you know, sharing a more experience, learning more about how you can actually create a real business case for inclusion of people with disabilities and reinforce that point where even if the government do not have a strict you know, uh, regulations about that, you still have the motive and you still have the commitment as an entity to lead on that and uh, thus uh, influence it positively at the end of the day. So basically um, these challenges also differ on Saudi Arabia level or when we zoom into Saudi Arabia, where uh, there is still also um, a need for, you know, committed uh, or, you know, uh, reinforced of the certain um, regulations. We had a huge transformation when it comes to the labor law and, you know, um, the um, uh, justice system and the human rights system for the people with disabilities. I'm sure that you are aware of the vision 2030, or you've heard about it. So uh, the vision have been really influential, kingdom wise, to change mindsets and start to look at the citizen as a person and recognizing the differences in these people. 
uh, and such it was encouraging for all everyone all the entities here to work towards this vision and it stated uh, that people with disabilities have the right like any other person to be to have free access to work to social and healthcare services and even to work environments so such vision is leading now the way for it but you know to actually that and keep that going you know and uh, keep the ball running uh, where you need to be really connected and unified into building into that momentum so uh, i you you mentioned uh, smart cities you know uh, we know that you know there's quite a good number of initiatives taking place all of all over the world and we know some of them they they uh, they start to engage with different communities to make sure that they don't miss them out from, from the infrastructure, from what they are building. Uh, what can you tell us about what is being done in Saudi Arabia about uh, having conversations with projects, people running projects that relate with smart cities to make sure that they are aware of the needs of people with disabilities that, and uh, that the conversation starts at the early phase instead of, oh, later on in time that they have to go and fix something that they built that was not proper to use. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Antonio, for this. Um, well, uh, I'm really glad that since around 2018, there was uh, a newly established authority called the Authority of Care for People with Disabilities. And that, in, uh, uh, you know, that authority now is responsible on raising more awareness to such projects in Saudi Arabia. Um, out of my, you know, um, work with them, I've been noticing that they've been trying to reach out for such projects, as Neil mentioned, Neon Project. Uh, we have also a lot of, you know, uh, under the work uh, projects, mega projects in Saudi Arabia, where they are trying, you know, rebuilding, revamping airports also all over the kingdom and other health institutions. So all of these projects now, um, uh, the authority is trying now to, you know, reach out for them to try to encourage them to take in considerations, whether it was the built environment, accessibility, or any other um, aspects. Uh, there are also collaborations with ministries of Ministry of Communication, for example. The discussion has been closely taking um, place around, you know, uh, catering for the people with disabilities on the digital platforms and what it means to be uh, accessible in the digital digital world. Um, out of also these um, uh, initiatives, there is also a um, uh, work with the Minister of Health regarding uh, creating um, uh, barrier-free, um, you know, digital platforms for, you know, patients with disabilities and the elderly. I can, you know, go on and, uh, on and on. There is a lot of initiatives that is actually tapping on on um, one of the big or mega projects. Uh, we hope, however, that the, these discussions, uh, whether it's still taking place, that are put in real plans, and executed also in a good manner because at the end of the day what we our priorities is that to have an actual on-ground usability and change for the, whether it's for customers or employees with disabilities at the end of the day. No, government services play an important role so and we, once again we've seen uh, accessibility being implemented in many different ways. What can you tell us about how uh, uh, accessibility is being implemented in government ser services in Saudi Arabia? Yes, definitely. I can mention a few. Uh, first, there is also uh, something called the Digital Transformation Program. It is one of the executive work programs I'm, I mentioned national-wise. And th this program uh, takes in consideration how they can transform all government um, uh, you know, services to the digital world and cater for people in general, including the needs of people with disabilities in this process. So we've witnessed a lot of change in the digital service is for the Ministry of Justice here in Saudi Arabia. Um, they have been successfully, you know, creating a process to, you know, uh, process legal, legal issues uh, in a very um, uh, usable, friendly manner. Uh, there is also the healthcare, the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Education, of course, that's a topic on its own because after COVID-19, education is still, you know, given in Saudi Arabia via online uh, platforms. So uh, there has been a huge 
transformation and creating an educational effect, an effective and educational platform for all students. And a lot of this discussions took part about students with disabilities and how we can uh, cater for them. And uh, I've held some uh, seminars. I think the last one was in the in last month with one of uh, the, uh, one of the major universities here in Saudi Arabia, King, uh, King Abdulaziz University in Jeddah, and they hosted me to speak about um, uh, you know digital transformation for people with disabilities. Um, what does that mean? What are the standards and what needs to be done uh, while creating digital platforms and catering for uh, students with disabilities during this pandemic? So I'm, I'm glad, you know, being asked to attend such seminars and, uh, you know, out of nowhere, they contact you and they, you immediately know that this topic now gladly became, you know, a priority and uh, the discussions need to take place and immediately you know such transformations need us also as specialists and consultants you know closely observing and you know working with these entities because it's a, it is um, a follow-up process and it's a growing process and you need to make sure that is effective all the way so before passing to neil i just i, I... I would like to know if, do you see the, the conversation on the topic that are talking here today as a conversation that is also taking place in several media in the Saudi society? No, is, is this something that people talk about? Um, I can say that um, it has been addressed somehow and maybe in a different, you know, um, uh, look or angle, because uh, there is has there has been a lot of discussion about you know minorities here in Saudi Arabia and people from different you know uh, backgrounds and uh, people you know from different uh, abilities or disabilities. Uh, they've been speaking about uh, you know uh, real life here and what we need to be doing to change our society for the better. And raising awareness about that immediately raises the people with disabilities awareness themselves and they it enabled them to speak up and to create the demand that we are trying to utilize as you know whether they're employees or talking about their work environments or customers talking about the need of having you know a proper quality service so creating this need really helps us back you know to uh, show the business case and uh, prove that people with disabilities are actually an important segment that is not only good as a human right to cater for them, but it's also making a great business case for it, for the business. Great. So um, I, I know that you've been doing some work with uh, IAAP as uh, yes. I've been on some of the same meetings as we're looking to look at sort of professionalization. You've talked about a bit about government services and you've talked about the, the sort of the fact that COVID has sped up that transformation. Uh, we've previously all in various different guises looked at maturity models and I know that you've worked on maturity modeling in Saudi Arabia. How is that working now and, and, and do you think that it's gained in importance given the, the, the rapid speed of of transformation that is now happening as a result of this global pandemic throwing everything up in the air and requiring us to do stuff differently. Yes. Um, thank you, Neil. Uh, yes, definitely. Um, the maturity model actually was one of the early projects that I've uh, worked uh, on regarding, you know, uh, creating a, um, a, a system where companies can be, uh, you know, uh, able to create um, what we say a truly inclusive work environment for people with disabilities. This project actually was translated and launched um, into 2000, uh, uh, 2017. It's one of the Ministry of Labor, uh, Ministry of Human Resources uh, national projects. And um, this project was basically um, um, 
well um, uh, adopted by companies here in Saudi Arabia. It was actually launched on different phases. It started with the mega companies in Saudi Arabia. And now uh, today it is also available for the medium and the small size companies. And um, uh, it was uh, greatly beneficial for us as consultants to have a framework that can, uh, using the maturity model here, um, uh, to work with the company starting the conversation about an, an, a real actionable plan to start you know, making the changes for its own employees and customers with disabilities. Um, uh, a lot of companies have joined the certification and obtained it, but I really look forward of having much more commitment from different organizations you know, to take this, not only as you know, a checklist or a certificate that they get, but you know, a, 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 but a real way, and uh, let's say a clear um, plan to start working on its own environments for the best or for the better. So uh, Mu'ama, it's called Mu'ama certification. And um, Mu'ama, um, since the pandemic also witnessed some uh, changes or let's say adaptations for uh, after to, for, to fit the, you know, after the pandemic situation. So um, the team there was working more on, you know, um, embedding, you know, the teleworking programs and, you know, the processes now that's been happening for most organization within its systems uh, and the, the certification uh, model itself. Um, also, they took in considerations of work, different work accommodations now that the pandemic is more or less um, um, have been, you know, taking a certain priorities in that and uh, safety, healthcare aspects of the maturity model and all of these, you know, um, issues that's relevant for uh, the employees of, uh, with disabilities within the organization, for example. So um, yes, some change, change in, uh, changes happen to Mu'ama and positive, I'm positive that um, the certification will even spread more if it was, you know, um, now linked to the safety and considerations for, you know, uh, the company's own employees or your own customers. And I think that will boost it more to become, you know, one of the um, go-to or let's say, you know, uh, uh, you know, major uh, certifications that companies should obtain here. So they're committed to it. So. Um, yeah, that's more about it. And also, um, you know, uh, that's where IAAP and also G3 ICT entities are helping me bringing more and advocate more about this here in Saudi Arabia. And I'm always glad because, you know, um, um, uh, benchmarking is very important in this process and while you are you know you have the access to the resources and the learnings from other entities that have been you know ahead of you in this game but at the same time you're trying to take the learning out of that and trying to see how it fits in your own you know business culture and your own processes here in Saudi Arabia. So a, a quick follow-up on, on this. So Mo'ama is um, a one-shot deal or is it something that you have to recertify over time? Yes, so definitely. It is something that you have recertify. It's not like a one project uh, thing. And that's what keeps the, you know, so the sustainability of the whole thing. And at the same time, it, it tells the company or the organization accountable if they did not, you know, work on the improvements they should have been working on in the previous year. So it's a, it's a good, actually, it's a good system where you keep in track and you're making sure that you are on the right way. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, I mean, that that's one of the things I like about maturity models is that they are not these, these one-shot deals. They, they're a way of tracking your progress within an organization and sometimes regression because reality is that that things change and some things improve, some things degrade over time and uh, businesses and organizations are, are sort of living things, if you like. And, and, and so you have to sort of monitor this and, and understand yes. and, uh, and, and, and look at uh, prioritizing this stuff. So I think it, you know, they're very valuable tools. Uh, when you say that you're, you're benchmarking, you know, I know from work with the Business Disability Forum in the UK that there is anonymous benchmarking goes on. Is the is the benchmarking anonymous in in Muhammad or is it um, public um, 
and by sector, because obviously different sectors have different priorities and different challenges. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, actually, we like uh, um, I have a lot of friends around here. So it's the BDF and G3ICT and IWP. I think we are all learning from it. And I really like how such organizations are committed to share the know-how uh, and the learning, of course. Um, for moi, Amma, uh, it is like um, uh, the certification where you need to put up a, a plan for it. And at the end of the day, um, it is important for us to think about it as a whole system. So this system should play part, you know, for organizations in a way that is helping them to grow also. So I definitely agree with you on the on the on the, the comment of you know having the flexibility and you know and the sustainability aspect of the maturity model. Definitely, of course. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I and. Where, where do you see these um, the next big thing in in accessibility being? I mean, there's there's so much um, innovation and potential for innovation in the space because of technology. Uh, I, I know that uh, the MENA region is actually investing heavily in technology to to diversify. That's what the, you know, the, the, the vision 2030 is all about. It's diversifying away from hydrocarbons into technology and tourism and knowledge economy. Where does accessibility fit in that? And, and where do you see there being opportunities? Well, you know, Neil, it's everywhere. I can see it in mostly every economical sector here. And even in the areas where we fairly have a lot of you know established systems especially you know even accessible system for people with disabilities but there is a lot of area of development so we're talking about healthcare education you know entertainment um, um work and you know any any uh, you know catering for customers with disabilities you know all of these segments uh, whether it's you know both in the physical and the digital platform there's definitely a need to develop on to grow on um, even now if we're talking geographically more you know the change has been made more towards the major cities but we still have lots of lots of you know smaller cities in the kingdom that also need and you know have people with disabilities so we're talking about rural areas or areas that lack the, you know what a big city would have as an infrastructure so still the work um there is a lot of work and uh, also there is a lot of work on, on the social mindset still and I think that will never ever end at the end of the day you need to having you know such a conversation today is still important to be taking place every now and then you know talking about the um, benefits of inclusion the impact of inclusion and accessibility is always something that needs to take place upon the table of discussions whether it's uh, business discussions or project discussions or innovation discussions so all of these discussions now it is important to be inclusive in your process of design it is important to be inclusive in the process of creating your ideas and innovations and you know everything that you're talking about at the end of the day your ideas must reach for everyone everyone must learn everyone must enjoy everyone must work so um, i think that should be the default maybe in the future somewhere Great. And, and you know, you've just, just said you've got so tons of work to do. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how are you going to do this? So I, I know you're working with G3ICT and Business Disability Forum and all, all of this. So is there a, a large group of accessibility consultants in the, the MENA region that's hiding somewhere? Or are you going to have to grow them? And if you're going to have to acquire these skills, What's the plan to do it? That's really insightful, Neil. Actually, yes, the discussions have been taking place with, uh, um, you know, uh, different uh, entities uh, in the MENA region to, you know, have a uh, one uh, entity that is, you know, representing um, such consultants and experts in this, um, this you know, uh, region. It is important to be unified. It is important for us, you know, to start catering for the Arab world and trying as much as possible make an influence there. So yeah, it's been going on. I hope there is something that I can, you know, talk about maybe 
at the end of the year or early next year. I'm not sure how this will be launched, but I'm really happy to be on um, witnessing that. Hopefully, inshallah, I will be there. So, um, and there's a lot of to, things to do for us to, you know, to bring this to, again, something to be working on and planning for, for the next years. Excellent. Um, Antonio, did you have something? No, uh, um, I, I don't. I think it's, you know, it was... Uh, <laughs> Something that that is very important for us is to is to sh share ideas and know uh, what everyone is doing in 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 different in different parts of the world. So it was great to have you with us today, I, uh, and we look forward to follow to follow the the conversation uh, on Tuesday on Access Chat. Yeah, thank you, and and of course we need to um, also thank. The people that keep the lights on and the website up and running and and our videos captioned so thank you to barclays access microlink and my clear text for continuing to support us and and yes as antonio says we look forward to you joining us on twitter on tuesday thank, thank you, you so much neil thank you antonio and also thanks to deborah though she's not here today yeah. but i i'm sure that she's been cheering for me all the way my good friend <laughs> oh, absolutely